Good evening, everybody. Are we doing all right tonight? Sort of, yeah, we think so, okay. <laughs> well, um, guys, uh, I'm looking forward to our time together tonight. Um, I'm really thankful that Jeff was able to fill in for me last week. Um, as I think most of you guys know, and if, if you don't, um, I'll um, update you, but we were gone last week. We, were, we spent the whole week in Michigan uh, because Cass's grandmother uh, passed away uh, pretty suddenly. And so we were up there for arrangements and services and different things. And so um, I really appreciate Jeff filling in for me last week. He had a lot of chapters that he covered. Uh, and so uh, I appreciate that a lot of time, a lot of study went into that. So thank you. Um, we are going to look at just a couple of the passages that he did last week, but today we're really going to focus uh, on Romans and some of the things that Paul wrote to us in Romans that have just been some of the bedrock of understanding the Christian faith uh, from the time of Paul all the way until today. And so I hope that these truths are truths that perhaps you're familiar with, that you've uh, known well and perhaps treasured. And if not, I hope that you'll grow to treasure them uh, from hearing some of the things that we're going to share and talk about tonight. Um, but before we do get into our, our Bible study, and, uh, and if you guys have been following along for all this journey or part of this journey or most of this journey or wherever you got in this journey, we have covered a lot of scripture uh, up to this point. We really only have about two months left. Uh, in this year of Bible study, not much more than two months. And we have made it through a lot of Old Testament passages. We've made it through the Gospels. We've made it through a lot uh, in the book of Acts. Uh, and so now we're, we're kind of coming into that uh, time where we're going to be looking at some of the writings of the letters, uh, some of the writings of the early apostles. Uh, but then we're going to be talking a little bit about Revelation, and we're going to be about done with this reading plan. It's hard to believe that we have already made it this far in the year, but we will be closing out our time on this plan uh, in the not-too-distant future. So I hope that's been uh, a blessing to you. I hope that you've learned something from it. You've, helped, you've been able to, to treasure Jesus a little bit more, understand how God's plan from beginning to end kind of unfolds and what that means for you. But before I do get into our Bible study tonight, are there those that we can... I lift up in prayer for our service tonight. Yes, Tim. I got a post I want to read. Okay. Update on Charlie. Yeah. This is from Scott. Those of you who know Charlie Morris. So his dad is still on oxygen and, and breathing on his own. He has not been on the vent since yesterday morning. He was doing pretty good today. This was yesterday. But anxious about not being able to stay off the vent. Pray for his strength tonight and he doesn't get anxious. Okay. But he's able to move his feet a little bit now, and he's able to bring the buzzer for the, for the nurse. Okay. Tim, I appreciate that update. Continue prayers for Charlie. This has been, is it two months? Are we at two months or a little over? Yeah, it's probably 60 days. Yeah, that's what I was thinking. We were about two months. I think it was right around the middle of August. Okay. Okay. Continue prayers for Charlie. Another thing, uh, I talked with Phil Brown today, and uh, he has a doctor. Thank you, Tim, for sharing that. Others tonight? Miss Wanda? Uh, remember Mark and Debbie? Yep. Um, and then I have a very special one. So. Okay. I saw other hands. Was it? Go ahead, Miss Valida. Oh, uh, Jody Green. Uh, it was on a ventilator, but I saw where they had to take him to uh, Allegheny Hospital in Pittsburgh. Okay. So, you know, because he's real critical, so. Okay. Others? Yes, Ms. Kay? My nephew's wife, Bam Paul, she's still in ICU and not doing well at all, but so far not on the ventilator. Okay. And then I remember Jody Green. What was the name? Jody, J-O-D-I-E. Jody Green, okay, yeah. He, um, he has COVID. Um, and they have, they have made him to Pittsburgh to specialty hospital, uh, fully intubated in the whole bed. So, okay. Remember him. Okay. Thank you, Kay. Yeah. yeah. His dad's name is the Colleen Butch. Okay. So that's Jody's father? Yes. Okay. He's actually done some work at the church before we were here. Okay. The work. I lost a friend today. 
I'm sorry. Others tonight? Jonathan, remember uh, Biddy's mother in law, Mary Sue? They moved her to Stone Rise today. And uh, remember Beth Spradlin? She's uh, in surgery right now. Uh, they're putting a stand in because her heart wasn't strong enough for open heart surgery. Who was that? Beth Spradlin. Okay. Others tonight? I have three. Okay, Dan. Um, good friend of mine, uh, little John, he told me that his uh, friend needs uh, prayers and stuff like that because uh, he having a hard time and stuff. And uh, the second is uh, my mom went to the car yard this today, and uh, so far. Uh, Everything uh, checked out good and stuff. Good. She uh, scheduled my mom for a uh, uh, 3D Doppler test and she had to get it done. And um, the third one is uh, continue to pray for these uh, two mothers. Lost a life uh, Monday in uh, uh, Canal State Forest. Guy accidentally got on a shooting spree and he shot the mother and stuff and uh, she was uh, she was pregnant and they killed her and the newborn baby and stuff mm -hmm. and killed the other woman and got in and took off a jewelry ride with the police car and they stopped the police car and that the canal store canal state forest and stuff okay and the um, third one is uh, pray for the Good spirits of uh, them uh, 21 uh, passengers was on that airplane that went down the other day and stuff. It was heading somewhere in the, it was uh, going so fast and couldn't get off the ground. It clipped the fence and crashed in the field. And so far, all 21 people walked away from that airplane. Mm -hmm. Okay. Any others tonight? Unspoken requests tonight? And we lost um, so many people. I think uh, 28 more people to COVID-19 for the state of West For the Virginia. state, yeah. They said uh, death toll for me is past uh, 4,000 now. Mm -hmm. It's over 4,100. Yeah. Guys, let's pray tonight. I couldn't believe the... The youngest person he read on the name was 28-year-old boy from Canal County. Mm. It can affect all ages. Yeah. Guys, we come before you tonight. Um, our hearts are heavy in this season. We read every day of loss of life from COVID or infections and people struggling with that. Uh, God, we, we see of um, shootings. We see of violence. Father, loved ones that we know that um, their days have ended and struggles of our loved ones. Um, so many things are going on in our lives. And God, it can be easy for us to be discouraged. It can be easy for us to, to wonder what's going on in all of this. And God, we, we may not always know what is going on. But God, we pray that you would help us to stand on some of the promises we're going to read tonight. That what we're experiencing right now is not all there is. God, you have good promises for our future, and I pray that we would see those and, and uh, base our actions today on those. God, we pray that you would be with our request tonight, um, that you continue to be with Charlie. God, be with Phil um, as he has an appointment tomorrow. And Father, you know that need. Be with Mark and Debbie. Um, Father, that a surgery for Mark would be scheduled and would be successful in the near future. God, for the, the gentleman we mentioned uh, battling COVID, in a severe fashion, we think of Jody Butch, God, especially Jody, as he's 
in Pittsburgh, God, just fighting for his life. I, I pray that you would help him. Uh, Father, you might come to his rescue. He might get what he needs. Father, if your plans are different, I pray that you'd move and work in that family. God, for um, Bev, who is an ICU also, uh, or who's not, um, or who's still an ICU, uh, Father, I just pray that you'd be with her um, and to help her. Father, all those that are affected by this, continue to help us to be diligent and being smart uh, that we can uh, prevent perhaps others from, um, from getting it. God, we pray that you'd be um, with all those that we have mentioned, uh, Father Anna and Haley and Mary Sue and um, Beth, uh, for uh, Daniel's friend, um, little John and his friend, Father, who's going through a difficult time. Uh, for Hazel, for her tests coming up, for the things we've mentioned that, uh, whether that was the passengers from the plane or uh, what took place in Kanawha State Forest, and Father, the unspoken request tonight. God, we know that when we read from Paul, he knew that when he prayed, he was praying to someone he expected to move and to work in a powerful fashion because he already knew how he had moved and worked. And God, I pray that we do the same thing, that you would just move and work in these requests and Father, we would trust you, that you have a good plan in all of these. And Father, that you would help people to see that in the midst of everything that's going on. God, encourage us tonight uh, in our time of study. And uh, just help us to play the role you would have for us to play in our families and our communities until you return. We thank you and ask these things in the name of Jesus. And amen. Um, as we come into tonight, I... I usually do like this brief summary of everything from the Old Testament, a, a summary of what has happened in the life of Jesus, a summary of what does that mean for, for God's plan for redemption, a personal salvation, of now being a part of the community of believers. And so uh, I'm just going to mention all that uh, in like two seconds, which is what I just did. And what I want to focus on tonight is what we've really been seeing in the book of Acts and then also what we're going to see in most of the writings that are coming up in the New Testament. If you're not familiar with the Apostle Paul, then you have done your faith a great disservice. Uh, if you are not familiar with Paul, who was Saul and persecuted the church, and of his testimony, and of his writings, if you're not familiar that most of the New Testament words that we have that encourage us were written by this man, if you don't know much about him, uh, I'm really sorry, because you have missed out on a tremendous encouragement uh, to your soul. And so we're going to look at him a little bit tonight. Uh, he is a perfect example uh, to me of a person who lived for God's glory, uh, who believed truly the, the truth of Jesus' life and death and resurrection and based his life upon it. And so there's really three things I want us to look about from Paul's life. Uh, Jeff did a good job talking about the, the latter stages of his life, uh, standing before uh, Festus and Agrippa of the, uh, the travel by boat to making it eventually to Rome, uh, where we believe he finished out his days. But I want to talk about three things tonight. I want to talk about Paul's testimony. What was Paul's testimony? Uh, what was Paul's theology? What did he believe that he wanted others to believe and what was his desire? So what, what was his testimony? What was his theology? And what was his desire? I think that that's going to help us uh, in our time together tonight. So I want you to go to Acts chapter 26 for just a moment. Uh, Acts chapter 26. Uh, when it comes to the book of Acts, there's so many good portions. Some of my favorite, uh, favorite verses from uh, Acts come from Acts chapter 26. Uh, what I want to do is I want to start uh, in verse 1, and I'm really going to read down through about verse, let's see. Okay, I'm going to read down to verse 23 for our time. So uh, 26, starting in verse 1, it says, So Agrippa said to Paul, now this is, uh, Paul has been arrested. Uh, he is on trial. They are waiting uh, to send him to Rome. Uh, and so what we're going to see is that uh, important people are kind of checking out Paul's case and are going to write letters to Caesar about what they think one way or another. And so he is now has this audience with some of the most important officials of the area. And so Paul is going to give his testimony to these people. Uh, in Acts chapter 26, verse 1, it says, So Agrippa said to Paul, You have permission to speak for yourself. It says, Paul, tell me. Tell me your story. Tell me your testimony. And then Paul stretched out his hand and he made his defense. I consider myself fortunate 
that it is before you, King Agrippa, that I am going to make my defense today against all of the accusations of the Jews, especially because you are familiar with all the customs and controversies of the Jews. Therefore, I beg you to listen to me patiently. My manner of life from my youth, spent from the beginning among my own nation and in Jerusalem, is known by all the Jews. They have known for a long time, if they are willing to testify, that according to the strictest party of our religion, I have lived as a Pharisee. Now, that is one of the, uh, one of the pieces of Paul's story that uh, should jump out at us. If you've ever heard the Pharisees, that's usually one of the groups of people Jesus had a lot of confrontations with. Whenever he would preach, whenever he would teach, whenever he would tell a parable, sometimes he would say woe to the Pharisees, right? Because they didn't understand, they didn't see. He even told in his great Sermon on the Mount, unless your righteousness exceeds that of the Pharisees, you're never going to enter the kingdom of God. And so the Pharisees were the most religious group of the time of Jesus. They were the most devout. Uh, they knew the law arguably the best. They thought they were the closest to God out of all peoples on earth. And Paul was one of them. Uh, in fact, Paul was probably one of the greater Pharisees, if you will, of his day. Incredibly learned, incredibly intelligent, had learned, uh, according to some of the other scriptures, under one of the best uh, of his day. And so he wasn't even just a Pharisee. He didn't just belong to that group. He was a good one amongst a great group, essentially. So he shares, that's a part of his testament. That's a part of his background. It's a part of who he is. In verse six, it says, and now I stand here on trial because of my hope and the promise made by God to our fathers, to which our 12 tribes hope to attain as they earnestly worship night and day. And for this hope, I'm accused by Jews, O king. Why is it thought incredible by any of you that God raises the dead? So apparently one of the greatest accusations um, against Paul was his belief uh, in the resurrection of Jesus. But if we go back to verse six for a moment, he says, I'm on trial today because of my hope and the promise made by God to our fathers. Uh, what promise is he referring to? Um, perhaps he is referring to a promise that was made to David that through him, through his line, a one would come that would rule forever. Uh, I think more likely that he's referring back to the promise to Abraham, that God made a promise to Abraham that one day a descendant would come that through that descendant, all people on earth would be able to be blessed. I think that because he mentions that reference to the 12 tribes, and of course we think of that as a very close descendants of Abraham himself. He says, I'm on trial today because I believe the promise of God has been fulfilled in the person of Jesus. And the Pharisees do not agree with that truth. He goes on in verse nine. I myself was convinced that I ought to do many things in opposing the name of Jesus of Nazareth. Uh, he's like, I was once convinced I was convinced as a part of the Pharisees that I should do many things to oppose the name of a person named Jesus. This person that walked and taught and performed miracles and did teachings, I was convinced that I should say many things against him and to oppose him and to oppose those who believe in him. In verse 10, and I did so in Jerusalem. I not only locked up many of the saints in prison after receiving authority from the chief priests, but when they were put to death, I cast my vote against them. And I punished them often in all the synagogues and tried to make them blaspheme. And in raging fury against them, I persecuted them even to foreign cities. Now, this is Paul laying out his testimony. Imagine a person on trial being asked questions Paul is presenting his story. And up to this point, uh, when it comes to Christianity, it's not exactly been positive, right? He's a Pharisee, a member of the, the group of people that were perhaps the most opposed to Jesus. He speaks about being opposed to Jesus. Not only did he think it was his duty to speak out against Jesus, he did many things against those who claimed to believe in him, especially after Jesus' death. Uh, resurrection uh, and ascension. He's like, listen, I even cast votes against people for them to die because they believed in this person named Jesus. 
I persecuted. I even went to cities outside of Jerusalem in order to make sure these people received justice. And in my eyes, justice at that time was punishment for anyone who believed in the name of Jesus. Uh, if we go on, let's skip down to verse uh, 16. He's going to talk about how he was confronted by Jesus on the way to Damascus. And let's pick it up in verse uh, 16. It says, these are the words um, of Jesus to him. But rise and stand upon your feet, for I have appeared to you for this purpose, to appoint you as a servant and a witness to the things in which you have seen me and to those in which I will appear to you delivering you from your people and from the Gentiles to whom I am sending you to open their eyes so that they may turn from darkness to light and from the power of Satan to God, that they may receive forgiveness of sins and a place among those who are sanctified by faith in me. Uh, after Paul's encounter with Jesus, Jesus, listen, I'm appointing you. I am pursuing you. I have a mission and a purpose for you, you will be among those who will have their sins forgiven. You will be among those who are sanctified by faith in me. I am sending you to now be a part of those Jesus followers. I'm sending you to plant and to grow and expand the church to fulfill the mission Jesus left to his disciples to go into all the earth, right? To Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria and to the ends of of the earth. So this is this is Paul Shane's testament. Listen, I am the least likely person to be standing before you, King Agrippa, proclaiming the name of Jesus. I am the least likely person to have been met and encountered by God and to have my sins forgiven. But I'm telling you, King Agrippa, that salvation is found in no one other than Jesus. And I have been sent by him to share that message with everyone I have an opportunity to share it with. That is, in summary, in paraphrase, what Paul is saying to King Agrippa. Now, I'm going to leave it there for a moment. That's Paul's testimony. Um, I would tell you that the fact that he went from persecuting Christians to becoming one, uh, to me, strengthens the credibility of the power of God. It strengthens the credibility of the access that people can have to salvation. Who is it available to? Listen, if it can even be available to people that once persecuted Christians, it can be available to you. It can be available to just about anyone. And that is what we're going to come to when we come to Paul's theology. How did Paul understand who God was and what God was doing in the world? Uh, Romans is perhaps the strongest book in the entire New Testament that talks to us about what it is that God has done for us in the person of Jesus. Uh, if we eventually ever walk through the book of Romans, I'll probably spend a couple of years on it because it's just that deep of a book. But for our sake of tonight, I'll try to spend just minutes, okay? Uh, for Romans chapter 3, uh, I want to take us to Romans chapter 3 for a moment and start. I'm going to read probably verses 9 through 12. But really, the, the focus of what Paul is going to say is in chapter 3, verse 9. Uh, he's writing this letter to the Romans. Uh, he's writing this before he gets to Rome to stand on trial before uh, Caesar. He writes this to share his faith and what that faith means to those who believe in Rome. But in chapter 3, verse 9, he says this. What then? Are we Jews any better off? No, not at all. For we have already charged that all, both Jews and Greeks, are under sin. One of the reasons why Paul was uh, on trial, one of the reasons why he was uh, brought before King Agrippa is because the Jews were so mad at him. And one of the reasons why the Jews were mad at him is he claimed that the law that they spent so much time trying to fulfill had already been filled in the person of Jesus whom they had crucified and that the Jews have no more access to God than anyone else if they don't go through the person of Jesus. And that was blasphemous to them. Like, you're going to tell me that all of the history of the Old Testament, that Jewish people aren't closer to God than everyone else in the world, I'll have none of it. And he said, listen, unless you could believe in Jesus, you are just as far away from God as anyone else who's never read or heard the Old Testament. That's the reason why he's on trial, part of the reason. They're upset with him saying such a thing. 
And he says this question, he addresses this again to likely Jewish believers in Rome. He says, what then? Are Jews any better off? He says, no, not at all. For we have already charged that all, both Jews and Greeks, are under sin. He goes on, as it is written, none is righteous. No, not one. No one understands. No one seeks for God. All have turned aside. Together they have become worthless. No one does good. Not even one. A core understanding of Paul's theology is that everyone is under sin. Whether Jew, Gentile, anyone. Anyone born male, female, whatever. We all are guilty before God of the sins that have been committed under Adam and all the sins that we have personally committed against God. Every person born into this world owes God everything. And we have not lived according to the ways God has asked for us to live. No one, if they're in the court of law, can give any kind of a defense for why God should love them or consider them to be counted righteous in his eyes. No one can bring any evidence in order to not get a guilty verdict. This is what Paul wants us to understand in our theology. Paul knows this about himself. He even writes in other places, although he was a Pharisee, he counts everything he learned, everything he knew as rubbish in order that he might gain Christ. That's something he writes in another uh, letter. And so he's saying, listen, no, none of that is anything in the eyes of God if we do not receive the person of Jesus. Uh, he's going to go on in chapter uh, Romans chapter 6, verses 20 through 23, to talk about everyone is a slave to something. And he says there's really only two forms of slavery. Now, when we talk about the subject of slavery, it is extremely loaded. Uh, we think about the history of America. We think about the eventual abomination. Uh, or abolition of slavery in our country, uh, which is right and should have happened. Uh, and we think of, of this loaded word of slavery and how it still happens in other places of the world. Uh, we think about perhaps um, a human trafficking, which is a modern form of slavery today. But when he talks about this, he's talking about this in the sense that all of us, all of us are enslaved to one of two things. We are either enslaved to sin that leads to death, or we are going to become slaves or servants of God that leads to to life. He says those are the only two categories that are going to matter at the end of the day. Uh, in Romans chapter 6, starting in verse 20, it says, For when you were slaves of sin, you were free in regard to righteousness. What he means by that is if you've ever had uh, someone in your life, and I'm sure that you have, you're like, listen, man, that church stuff's not for me because I want the freedom to do what I want to do. Maybe you talk to someone like, listen, I just want to kind of get out what I want to do. And then later in life, you know, I'll, I'll receive Jesus. I want to get whatever I want to do. I want, you know, I want the freedom. Because if I go to church, they're going to tell me I can't do this. They're going to tell me I can't do this. They're going to tell me I can't do this. I want the freedom away from what it is that God's expectations are on my life. I don't want bogged down with any of those rules or regulations. And that's what he's talking about. Verse 20 says, for when you were slaves of sin... You were free in regards to righteousness. You were free from God's standards to do whatever it is you wanted to do. But you didn't realize that, yeah, you were free from righteousness, but really you were enslaved to doing your own ways. And doing your own ways weren't going to get you anywhere good. Verse 21, but what fruit were you getting at that time from the things of which you're now ashamed? Paul says, yeah, so you got to live however you wanted to live. He says, and how did that work out for you? Well, what fruit did you have from doing things in a way that's not how God wanted them to be done? Are you not now ashamed of that time that was wasted or that time that you cannot have back? It says, for the end of those things is death. The end of living for yourself outside of God's ways is death. Death. Paul would say if he was a Pharisee the rest of the days of his life and never received Jesus, all that he would have earned was death. Verse 22, but now that you have been set free from sin and have become slaves of God, the fruit you get leads to sanctification and, and its end, eternal life. For the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. Perhaps Romans 6, 23 is one of the most quoted verses, especially when it comes to sharing faith with someone. 
when it comes to the book of Romans. For the wages of sin is death. He says, there's only two things that you serve. You either serve sin or you serve God. If you serve sin, the end result, what you're paid for, right? Wages are paid. If you get a job, you earn wages, right? So if you serve sin, you're going to get death every time. It's the only thing you're going to get paid if you sin. He said, if you're a slave to sin, all of us are slaves, right? All have sinned. All have fallen short of the glory of God. No one does righteous. No, not one, right? Paul says, Jews, uh, Gentiles, everybody. None of us are free from being slaves to sin. He said, those who have received Christ, because it's the free gift of God, will now have eternal life. Because you're not any longer a slave to sin. It says, now you're a slave to God. When you see what Jesus has done for you on the cross, you cannot help but desire and want to live for him. So now being a slave to whatever you wanted to do, now it's like, listen, what does God want me to do? Because I want to do what God wants me to do. And whenever we become slaves of God, the end result of that is eternal life. Now, the contrast between death and life are, is pretty, pretty vast, right? Uh, there's, a, there's a great separation here. So Paul's theology is that all of us are sinners. All of us either serve sin, which will give us death, or we serve God, which will give us life. Now, Paul knows that everything in his life up to the moment that he received Jesus earned him death. Paul knows that. That's why Paul wrote like Paul wrote. This is Paul that wrote this, okay? The guy that condemned Christians, the guy that led to Christians dying for their faith, he knows that he did incredible sins before Jesus got a hold of his life. But what's amazing is what he's going to say is the promise of Romans chapter 8. Romans chapter 8 is one of the deepest, most encouraging chapters in the New Testament, he's going to say, for those who have received Christ, for those who see their need, have been called to God and are going to live their lives for him. This is what he says of them. In Romans chapter 8, verse 1, it says, There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Now, before he met Jesus, he thought every Christian, everyone in the name of Christ deserved to be contend, condemned and deserved to be dead. That was how Paul viewed Christians at one point until he realized, until God got a hold of him and opened his eyes, brought him from darkness to light, that all who have received Jesus, there's no condemnation for those people. When we realize what Jesus has done for us, we've all sinned, we've all fallen short of the glory of God. What Jesus did is that he paid the price of our sins for us. He experienced death. The wages that we earned were paid to Jesus on the cross. And Jesus, as the hymn says, paid it all. And so for Paul, when he writes chapter 8, verse 1, I don't know if he does it with tears in his eyes. I'm not sure because Paul is a tremendous writer. Maybe he was really bold as he writes this. But he knows that when he stands before God, all the sins that he did, even the sins of convicting Christians and leading them to their death, has been forgiven of him. He knows that. How can I know that? Because this is what that verse says. There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. The sins of Paul, as gross as they may have been, as gross as he felt them to be, and he openly admitted that in his testimony, have been forgiven graciously by the work of Jesus. Now, he spends a lot of time in Romans saying, listen, if that's what Jesus has done, does that mean we're free to sin and do whatever we want to do? He's like, by no means. And we clearly know from Paul's life there is there's regret and sadness of our actions that he has done in the past. But those who genuinely receive Jesus, there's no condemnation for them because they are changed people. Uh, in verses 2 through 14, it tells that true believers are going to walk within that spirit of God. It says, For the law of the spirit of life has set you free in Christ Jesus from the law of sin and death. For God has done what the law weakened by the flesh could not do. 
By sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin, he condemned sin in the flesh in order that the righteous requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us who walk not according to the flesh, but according to the spirit. For those who live according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh, but those who live according to the spirit set their minds on the things of the spirit. For to set the mind on the flesh is death, but to set the mind on the spirit is life and peace. For the mind that is set on the flesh is hostile to God, for it does not submit to God's law, indeed it cannot. Those who are in the flesh cannot please God. You, however, are not in the flesh, but in the spirit, if in fact the spirit of God dwells in you. Anyone who does not have the spirit of Christ does not belong to him. Uh, but if Christ is in you, although the body is dead because of sin, the spirit is life because of righteousness. If the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Christ Jesus from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his spirit who dwells in you. Now, that, that's extremely wordy and it says a lot. Um, so I'm going to try to, uh, to simplify, but hopefully not simplify it too much. When we talk about what Jesus has done, uh, some people try to use that. Well, if this is what Jesus has done, then he's forgiven all sins of all people for all time. Well, I'm going to say hold up on that for a second. Because Paul would say that Jesus' sacrifice um, occurred and is applied to those who it's clearly evident that the Spirit moves and works in their life. Paul would not have said he could have received Jesus and then continued to go from place to place and issue out uh, these arrests and these things in order for believers to be put in jail. Paul understood the moment Jesus got a hold of his life and his sins were forgiven that he now lived as God intended him to live. There was a change that must happen. It must occur. And it's clearly evident from Paul's life up to this point that that change occurred, that Paul now walked in step with the spirit. He was now not influenced by the law of sin and death. That wasn't what drove his life, but the law of the spirit of God is what drove his life. It's not that Paul never sinned again, but his life wasn't characteristic. It wasn't driven by the impulse of sin. And so we see that if we're going to continue to live, if a person claims to be a Christian, but continues to live in a way that is not remotely godly, that person has not received Christ, even if they say that they have. Paul would say only a person whose life has changed and is growing in godliness is a person who has received the Spirit of God. If a person claims Christ, but does not have any evidence of the Spirit moving in their life, then we know that that person has not been born of God, according to the writings of Paul. Uh, he goes on to say in verses 15 through 23 that true believers know that they've been adopted by God. It's a great phrase, a great verse that we see, a great illustration uh, in the New Testament to describe what God has done for us. Paul was adopted into God's family. Any person who becomes a Christian was adopted by God because none of us could earn the right to be a Christian. We must understand this right. Paul could not have become Paul if God had not done something tremendous in his life. Paul understands that what God has done in his life is he has now adopted him to be a part of his family. And he is now supposed to act as if he has the family resemblance. That's the expectation of us as well. What has happened in Jesus, what has been extended to us, the offer of forgiveness, is that now we live in such a way that we want to please our father. We don't want to displease our Father. We want to live in such a way as if we reflect the very characteristics and the very nature of God himself. And in verses finally 24 through 39 of this chapter, true believers know that salvation is a gift from God. It wasn't even necessarily something that, that they chose. Uh, I, I love how um, some ministers say that a person who realizes they've received Christ will think that they have walked through the door only to realize after they've walked through the door that it was God who opened the door for them to walk through. Um, it's one of those things that it's hard for us to wrap our minds around because we, we, we hear this word choice and clearly there was this moment in which we embrace the truth of Jesus and, and there is clearly interaction that is on our responsibility to be in step with the Spirit. Paul will talk about that later in the New Testament. But he also clearly says that there is no way he would have his testimony or be writing this book 
if God had not been the one who initiated the change in his life. Paul's like, I was going to Damascus to put Christians in jail and I left Damascus a Christian. And I couldn't have done that. God had to have done that. And so uh, I want to close, or not necessarily, uh, no, I'm not going to close yet. I just want to, I want to read a couple of verses at the end of chapter 8, and then I'll close with one more slide. But, because uh, we've talked about Paul's theology, and uh, this is one of his, his uh, closing thoughts of Romans chapter 8. Um, he says, the, What then shall we say to these things? To everything he said so far, to, to forgiveness that can only be found in Jesus, to Jesus um, dying while we were yet sinners, to everybody being unrighteous for sin equaling death or life in the Spirit uh, equaling eternal life. He says, what, should, what do we say about all of this? He says, if God is for us, who can be against us? He says, if God has freely offered himself to us, if Jesus himself has claimed us as his own, then who else can speak against us? He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also with him graciously give us all things? Who shall bring a charge against God's elect? Now think about this. This is a man who was had charges brought against him. This is a man who's been a perilous journey going to Rome because of charges by the Jews. This is a man that was going to have to, or was supposed to stand before uh, Caesar to give an account because charges were brought against him legally that could have ended his life. He says, who can bring a charge against God's life? He's like, well, humans can bring legal cases, but when it comes to heaven, there is no one that can stand and say, when I am face to face with God, that I can't enter. Because God alone is the one who makes that call. And I know, because of what he's done for me in Jesus, that he's going to say, come on in. He says, it is God who justifies. Who is to condemn? Christ Jesus is the one who died. More than that, who was raised, who is at the right hand of God, who indeed is interceding for us. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation, distress, persecution, famine, or nakedness, or danger, or sword? When he lists that verse, he has experienced all of those things. We have seen those, heard those, and what we've read about so far uh, in the life of Paul. He's experienced tribulation, he's experienced distress, persecution, famine, uh, nakedness, danger, sword, all of those things he's experienced. He said, did any of those experiences separate him from God's love? No, it was because of God's love for him that he ended up being put in situations in which those things were true to him because he was fulfilling the mission God called him to do. On to verse 17. No, in all of these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. While Paul was in chains going to Rome, he said he was still more than a conqueror. I mean, if you're in chains and you're a prisoner and you're giving a defense of yourself, it might be hard for a person to consider you a conqueror. But he's like, listen, this world has already been overcome in my life. And I am waiting for what the next world is going to be. And I know it's going to be good. And so I'm a conqueror, even though in this moment I may be in chains. Now, that's what, that's what he's trying to get across to us. Uh, for I am sure that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all of creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. He says nothing can separate us from the love of God that is displayed for us in the person of Jesus. This is Paul's theology. This is what he would want us to know and understand about God. And so I want to close with this. What is Paul's desire for us? Out of his testimony, out of his theology, what would he want from us? Uh, hold a finger on Romans chapter 10, verse 9, but we're not going to read it yet. We're going to go back to Acts chapter 26, where we started with his testimony. Acts chapter 26. This is what Agrippa says to Paul after Paul gives his testimony, talks about his life before Jesus, talks about his encounter with Jesus, talks about how he's represented Jesus since then, and the Jews arrested him for it. This is what uh, King Agrippa says to him in verse 28 of uh, chapter 26 of Acts. And Agrippa said to Paul, in a short time, would you persuade me to be a Christian? Because this is his moment to give a defense, to get out of the charges the Jews have given against him. And he says, you've used your time 
however brief it may be, and would you really want me to be a Christian based on what you've just told me? I love Paul's response. Verse 29, and Paul said, Whether short or long, I would to God that not only you, but also all who hear me this day might become such as I am, except for these chains. Paul says, yes, I want you to be a Christian. I want everyone who hears this testimony to be a Christian. I don't want you to have to experience the chains that can come with belief. But I do want you to be a believer, as what Paul would say. So that's the reason why I'm enduring these chains, so that you might hear about the salvation that comes from Jesus alone. So Paul's desire for us is that we would embrace Jesus as he did. In Romans chapter 10, verses 9 and 10, uh, this is also uh, popular verses when it comes to trying to share faith with someone else. Uh, Paul says that if he wants us to become a Christian, he wants us to believe in Jesus' death on the cross for us, that the wages of sin, that we've earned death, Jesus experienced that death for us, that we might receive the life that he deserved. In Romans chapter 10, verses 9 and 10, Paul says this is how someone receives that gift of salvation. Because if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart one believes and is justified, and with the mouth one confesses and is saved. So my friends, if that's something you have not done, now, it's possible because this is a Wednesday night and we're a smaller crew and most of you guys I get to see week after week that you have clearly done this. But I don't want to assume that that's true because Paul, before he met Jesus, met with a group of people that read the Bible regularly and thought they knew it really well, except they missed the person of Jesus entirely. So I don't want to assume that everyone in this room is a believer and has put their faith and trust in Jesus. But Paul says it's simply confessing with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believing in your heart that God raised him from the dead and you'll be saved. He says, because from the heart one believes and is justified and with the mouth one confesses and is saved. He says, someone hears the message of Jesus, that someone loves you enough that you earn death, that you have not lived in the way God wanted you to do, and that someone else died that death for you. In fact, it was God's own son, Jesus, who came to pay the price for your sins. That you, you, you've heard that, but you haven't just heard it, you believe that to be a part of your story. And that Jesus did not stay dead, but God raised him from the dead. And because God raised him from the dead, you are now justified. Your account with God is settled. It is done. You can stand before God whenever your days here are ended, and he can welcome you home because you've accepted the sacrifice of Jesus on your behalf. And you haven't just done that internally and never told anybody else, but you've made that your public statement. This is who I am, as Paul did with King Agrippa and as Paul did just about every single place he went. So it's my hope for you, it is Paul's desire and my desire, um, that you would be a Christian. Not a Christian in title, but a Christian because you have confessed with your mouth that Jesus is the Lord of your life. You've truly believed in your heart that God paid for your sins in the person of Jesus, that God raised his son from death to life, and that he has that waiting for you when your days here are over. That's my hope and my prayer and my desire for you. Uh, if that's something that you're not sure about or you've got questions or concerns about, please talk to me. This is the most important thing you can get right in your life. If you get other things right, but you don't get this right, you haven't got anything right, according to Paul. So I hope as we continue through uh, the rest of the New Testament, is this man that's going to write a lot of the words that we're still going to look at, we're still going to examine his life, but everything comes back to this, that there was a moment in which he understood Jesus for who he was, and he embraced that and lived out of that truth the rest of his days. And that's what he calls everyone to do until Jesus returns. So guys, that's, that's our role as, as believers. And if you're not a believer, that's what you still need to do before the, the days of this world are over. Let's close uh, tonight in prayer. God, we want to thank you for the testimony of Paul. 
that Father, we could be here tonight and we could think of sins that we've done that might convince us that Father, you couldn't forgive us. Uh, that if people just really knew us, if people just really knew what we've done, uh, people just really knew our past. Uh, you know, this whole Christian thing might be for people that are mostly good, have only done little things. Um, but God, you tell us in the testimony of Paul that your salvation is open to all who would receive it. Uh, your salvation is open even to people that persecuted Christians, even to people who could be responsible for their deaths. Father, you, there is no person whose sins you cannot cleanse. So, Father, I pray that that wouldn't hold anybody up tonight that might be hearing these words, whether that's folks that are in this room or maybe someone might watch this online and be like, man, I, can God really forgive me? The answer to that is yes. You have stated that clearly in the life of Paul. So, Father, I pray if there's someone in this room or someone that might hear this eventually that says, I, I've never asked forgiveness of my sins, and if God really loved me enough to die for me, I, I, want, uh, I, I want that. I, I want to receive that forgiveness and, and live in a way that is pleasing to God. I, I want the gift of His Spirit to guide me and direct me. So I'm no longer under the law of sin and death, but I'm under the law of the Spirit. God, I pray that you press upon people their need to do that if they have not. Uh, God, for those of us in this room that have done that, Father, we can think of either a day and a time or a moment, Father, we, we, but we know that that has happened. God, I pray that you would cause us to be faithful to what you have done in our lives, that we would be examples for you as Paul was. We would be ready to give a defense. We would not be afraid to give a defense. We would not be afraid even to suffer for standing on that truth in a world that just thinks that's so dumb outdated, unnecessary, so restrictive. God, I pray that you'd help us to stand on that truth, Father, to do so well until you return. God, encourage us as individuals, uh, meet our needs, and encourage us as a church to do what you've asked us to do. We thank you. We ask these things tonight in the name of Jesus. And God's people said, amen. amen. <laughs> I didn't open it for questions or anything tonight, but that's okay. Um, <laughs> hey, you. Oh. But, uh, you're welcome, sir. Daddy. 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 Good. <laughs> That is your Bible? It is my Bible. Yes. Yes. <laughs> it's good. I, I guess y'all are dismissed. <laughs> the kids have concluded that service is over. <laughs> okay, Danny, I'll look forward to that. Can you talk? Hmm. What are you going to say? <laughs> what are you looking for in my bag? Water. I don't have water in my bag. In fact, I don't think I even brought water today. I'm sorry. I'm thirsty too. I don't think I brought my water today.